So without any further ado, we have Robert Lowry in the house with Pool Chemistry for Service Pros. Um, if you guys do not own copies of Mr. Lowry's book, this, is, this one right here has been used a multitude of times as we filmed uh, all kinds of different people uh, in the studio uh, that uh, claim to be professionals in the industry. They've used this exact book, Bob, they, and uh, I, you know, again, we use it as a resource other. So, Bob, what, what are we gonna learn today? Well, we're going to take you through a, a method of taking care of, of a pool if you're a service tech, but take you through a method of taking care of the pool. And it differs from other things that you've been doing for a few reasons, the biggest probably of which is to use borate in your pools. But we're going to take you through a method that, that takes care of everything in your pools, so in the pools that you are taking care of. And in the, uh, in the end, if you follow this program on all of your pools, you will save between probably 30 and 50% on your chlorine bill alone per month um, and every month. So there's money in there for you if you follow this program. And the program itself is not much different than what you've already been doing. It just puts it together in a plan and helps you to understand the, the way that each of the chemical parameters interact with each other and that you are sometimes creating your own problems. Uh, for instance, if cyanuric acid gets real high, your killing power of your chlorine goes down. And so there's a lot of these things that influence each other that you need to be aware of. So we're gonna bring you those today and, um, and get started on this. So, um, there is another book, um, uh, Randy mentioned the first book, which is called Pool Chemistry for Residential Pools, and it is a 226-page book um, It contains pretty much everything I know about pool chemistry. Um, the other book, which is on your screen right now, is called Pool Chemistry for Service Pros. Um, and it's for residential pools only. But this is what I will be talking through today. Um, it is that book, and it's a 28-page book. And if you don't have a copy, you can get one from Amazon.com as an ebook or as a print version in a couple of days. It still is about 10 bucks. Um, so um, you probably should get a copy of it and be able to follow this plan. Anyway, welcome. I think most of you know who I am. The short version on me is that um, I've been in the pool industry for 47 years. Um, I'm a chemist. I used to own Robarb. I used to own Leisure Time Chemical. I used to own Service Industry News. And I've been a consultant for 27 years. And I have um, written 21 books on pool chemistry. So um, I've also invented 111 chemicals. And I used to be a CPO instructor, and I've written about 175 articles for magazines. Anyway, without any further ado, good morning from Lima, Peru, which is where I live and where I'm talking to you from today. Anyway, um, so the biggest problem that service techs face is balancing the water and understanding how changing one condition affects another. And as you can see, it's just each of these parameters and each of these water conditions and the chemicals that you can add can have an effect on each other. And it's kind of confusing to know, you know, what you do if you change one thing, how it affects a bunch of other things in the pool. So um, to kind of lead into what we're doing today, what if I told you I could balance a pool in a few hours? Um, I can make the pH 7.5, I can make the total alkalinity 90, and we can keep the alkalinity from going up, the, the pH and alkalinity stable. So we, we're able to actually do that, which is what your goal is uh, as a service tech, to make the pool stable so nothing changes. Cyanuric acid has been around for, for practically forever. It was developed in the 50s and, and promoted uh, strongly in the 60s and is the most popular method of taking care of pools is to use trichlor in the pool 
But the problem is it dispenses cyanuric acid when you do that. So um, cyanuric acid doesn't just protect chlorine from sunlight. It also acts as a buffering agent for pH. It lowers pH and alkalinity. It controls how much chlorine is available in your pool for disinfection and oxidation. It affects the chlorine kill rate in your pool. It affects the saturation index calculation, and it increases your need for free chlorine in the pool. So what if I told you I can tell you exactly how much chlorine you need in each pool? So sometimes two to four parts per million of chlorine that's recommended by PHTA doesn't always work. And I can show you the math behind it to show you why it doesn't work. So um, we're, we have methods to figure this stuff out. And if you learn these things, you'll be able to know in your pools exactly what you should be doing. Also, one of the big myths in the pool industry is that liquid chlorine raises the pH of pool water. And, and so does CalHypo. And I'm here to tell you that it doesn't do that. But I'm also here to tell you that I'm also human. And up until about eight or nine years ago, I thought that liquid chlorine raised the pH of the pool water too. So, and, and I'm supposed to know about these things. So I just didn't think it all the way through. And now that it's been thought all the way through, um, I can tell you that, that liquid chlorine doesn't raise the pH of the pool. So anyway, we can talk about that a little later. Um, borate is a hot issue, especially in California right now. Um, borate is a great chemical for your pool. Now, please understand that I do not work for a borate uh, maker. I don't sell borates. I don't make a penny in commissions or, or sponsorships or anything from anybody that does make borate. It is a great chemical. It's been around since 1984. It was the first patent on using uh, borates in pools. The patent expired in 2001 and people have been able to use it without infringing upon that cat patent since then. Um, it is a great chemical. It can save you big amounts of money. It will also make your, your water quality better, and it will reduce your chlorine bill each month by between 30 and 50% in all your pools. And that's a big number. Just figure up how much money you spend every month on, on chlorine, and you're going to save between a third and a half of that uh, by putting borate in your pools and you only have to put it in the pool once. There also are four apps that you should probably think about buying and you can buy all of them for less than 20 bucks. And we'll talk about all of these later, but there is the pool acid dose calculator, which calculates uh, the amount of acid to lower pH and alkalinity, a chem dose calculator for um, determining the amount of, of each chemical you can add to the pool. Um, and it's based on gallons, so we can do that. There's a drain calculator for when you need to, to drain part of a pool when you've got some amount of that condition in the pool, like when there's 600 parts per million calcium in the pool, you want to get it to 350, but the fill water's got 150 in it. So how much of the pool do you drain? So there's that. And then there is the NPC saturation index calculator. And um, I wrote that for the uh, National Plasters Council, and it's available for five bucks. It does not tell you um, what chemicals you need. It just tells you what the saturation index is. Anyway, balancing the pool by industry guidelines may not work. And the reason is that the PHTA guidelines for outdoor residential pools suggest that there is a minimum, an ideal, and a maximum for each level. But there is no footnotes or legend to say when a minimum condition is okay, when a maximum condition is okay. So it's confusing right from the start, when is a minimum okay, and when is a maximum okay? So and if a condition is between a minimum and maximum, is that okay? So there aren't any reasons given, and it's kind of confusing. And in fact, if you take 
all of the minimum levels of, of the PHT recommends a pH of 7.2, a total alkalinity of 60, a TDS of 300, and a calcium hardness of 150 with no cyanuric acid in the water, you would have a negative saturation index of minus 0.8, which is corrosive water. So you get corrosion even if you're following the standard. And if we do the opposite, if we take all the high levels uh, of the PHTA uh, recommendations, we use pH 7.8, total alkalinity 180, TDS of 1,800, uh, calcium hardness of 1,000, cyanuric acid of 100, we will get stains and scale. And the Langmuir saturation index would be a positive 0.76, which is severely corrosive. So they've created a standard that you can be at minimum and maximum level and still have stale, scale and corrosion. And that to me doesn't sound like the way to write a standard. So the conditions, even at the low side of ideal, would give you a negative 0.3, which is still corrosive water. So their standard has is almost a recipe for failure. If you keep all of it, everything at, at either low or high or, or not exactly at the median of ideal, uh, you can have unbalanced water and, and cause problems. So what I suggested that we do is change um, the ranges to a much narrower thing that we call a target. And so just before we get to that, how do you decide if something's okay? We said the minimum pH is 7.2, ideal is 7.4 to 7.6, and high or maximum is 7.8. So what is 7.3? It's right in between minimum and, and ideal, so what is it? You know, so there's some confusion even, on, even within a single parameter. So what I've done is replace all of the ideal ranges with a target. And so then we have a pH of 7.5, a total alkalinity of 90. There's not really a target for TDS. We just don't want it to be more than 1,500 parts per million over startup. Calcium hardness, 350 parts per million for plaster pools, 250 parts per million for fiberglass, vinyl, and so on. With a saturation, uh, with a cyanuric acid level of a maximum of 50 and a minimum of 30. Although there, we can put a little footnote to that, that if you do have a saltwater chlorine generator, we can go to 70 parts per million of of uh, cyanuric acid. In fact, we recommend 60 to 70 if you have a saltwater chlorine generator. We'll talk about that also later. So the advantage of having um, targets is that you automatically know when you look at a number whether it's below the target or not. So 7.3, we were wondering if we compare it to the PHTA level, is it okay or not? And now if we have a target of 7.5 and say the pH is 7.3, what is it? It's low. So um, it's easier to define what's wrong. So with that in mind, we can talk about pH and alkalinity and their relationship, which is actually called buffering. And I hope this is not a new, uh, a new word for you, but, uh, or a new concept for you, but Buffers in the water keep the pH from changing. And alkalinity is one of the buffers in the water, and it keeps pH from, from going too low. So, um, so it prevents the pH from changing low, but if you have a high alkalinity, um, the pH will, will continually be rising um, because the alkalinity is high. If you have a low alkalinity, the pH would be too easy to change. So every time you put anything in the water, the pH changes. So we need some amount of alkalinity, but not too much. And the right level prevents it from going too high or too low. And the right level prevents it from going too low better than too high. So 
Yeah. Hey, Bob, uh, Bob uh, Randy over here. I want to do a little uh, house cleaning as we move on through these slides. We've got a lot of people watching over on Facebook. Uh, we are recording this. Um, it, we are monitoring the questions in the Facebook chat. Uh, I did also post uh, for you to move on over. If you'd like to talk to Bob, you can move into the uh, Zoom room. And, uh, and we've got a great number of uh, rock stars over here, too, in the Zoom room where you can actually interact with Bob directly. So uh, follow that link through. Uh, and once again, we are recording this, and it will be available after the seminar for those of you that didn't show up. Thank you, Bob. OK, sure. Um, usually, you cannot change pH without changing alkalinity. And I say usually because there are a couple of things that you can do. But acid, if you add acid, it lowers pH and it lowers total alkalinity. If you add soda ash, it raises pH and it raises alkalinity. Bicarb, sodium bicarb, baking soda, raises total alkalinity but doesn't change the pH. Um, and if you've been trying to use bicarb to change pH, you're doing it wrong because pH doesn't change with bicarb. Aeration and turbulence, however, is a pretty cool thing. And if you, if, if you will at least learn this today, you will you'll be in a lot better position than a lot of other techs. And that is that aeration and turbulence raises only the pH of the pool without changing alkalinity. And this is really important because we, if pH and alkalinity are both low, we can lower alkalinity to the right level with an amount of acid, which will make the pH too low, but it'll make the alkalinity correct then we can aerate and cause turbulence in the pool to raise the pH up to whatever level we want. And this will be great because we can get alkalinity where we need it, then get pH where we need it, and we can do it quickly with only just air. So um, we'll talk about that in a little bit too. There is no chemical that lowers alkalinity that, doesn't, that will not change pH. And there's no chemical that lowers pH with no change to alkalinity. Um, there is, and you can add CO2 to a pool, and it will lower pH without changing alkalinity. However, these are not very common uh, or commonly used in residential pools. They are used in commercial settings, but what we have happening then is the pH gets lowered all the time without changing alkalinity, and then we get alkalinity going up too high and the pH going too low. And you end up having to add acid to get the alkalinity back down. So um, again, this um, presentation is for residential pools and not for commercial pools. And I, I want to mention that and stress that, that, that there are some differences between what we're talking about today for residential pools and some for commercial pools. However, the chemistry itself remains the same. The difference would be uh, disinfection and oxidation, and it is different for both bodies of water. So, buffering of pH, buffers prevent the pH or inhibit the pH from going down. There are three buffers in the pool system. One is alkalinity, one is cyanuric acid, and the other is borate. And borate we're going to talk about in a minute as keeping the pH from going up. But alkalinity and cyanuric acid keep the pH from going down. And in this slide, I want you to see that, that over on the left of that graph, at a pH of 8, the amounts of acid to lower pH are closer to each other. They should be farther apart because at a high pH, it takes more acid to, to go down. But as we move to the right, you can see it takes more and more acid to, to lower the pH. And the amount of, of, of uh, the amount of alkalinity changes how much acid we need. And what this is showing then is that because it takes more acid to lower the pH, the pH is being buffered by the alkalinity. And so it's not important that you understand the numbers so much here as it is to understand that, that alkalinity is buffering the pH from going down. So the other uh, condition in the water, the other chemical that's in the water that buffers pH is cyanuric acid. 
The cyanuric acid is also a buffer. It takes a little more acid to change the pH, uh, to change the pH, pH when uh, there's more alkalinity in the water and more cyanuric acid. So this shows together that the both of them are a good buffer system to keep the pH from going down. Then we can add borate to the pool. And as you can see from this chart, it's opposite of the other. As the pH goes up, um, it takes more and more soda ash to raise the pH. It should take less, but it takes more because borate is in the water, preventing the pH from going up. So the three of them uh, become an excellent thing to keep the pH from going up or down. And this is a, go a real goal in your pool is balancing the pool all the time. And if we get the proper alkalinity, the proper cyanuric acid level, and the proper borate level in the pool, the pH isn't going to be going anywhere. It's going to stay right where it is. So from one week to the next, if it's a one call a week, from one call to the next, the pH isn't going to be going up. And so um, it's a good thing to do to keep the pH from going up or down um, by using uh, the proper levels of these three chemicals in, in your pools. So again, total alkalinity and cyanuric acid keep the pH from going down. Borate keeps the pH from going up. So that will keep it right where we need to. So raising the pH without raising alkalinity. I usually do a demonstration here, and I don't have much time to do it right now, but um, aeration, turbulence, or splashing raises pH of the pool with no change in alkalinity. And so there's a number of ways you can do that. As you can see on this slide, that uh, somebody built a little manifold that they plug into the return line and shoot the return water out at about a 45 degree angle and that causes turbulence and aeration. Um, in the second picture, there's a picture of a compressor attached to a, a, an air stone like you would have in an aquarium, and that creates turbulence and, and bubbles also, and that uh, drives CO2 out of the water. And one of the best ways that I've found um, for reducing the, the, I mean, raising the pH in the pool water is to take a submersible pump uh, that pumps about 100 or 150 gallons a minute and put it on the top step of the pool. So it's in a few inches of water and then aim the, the discharge from the, the pump up into the air so it splashes down into the middle of the pool. And this really um, does raise the pH of the pool. In tests that we did, um, we raised the pH of a 15,000 gallon pool from 7.0 to 7.5 in 30 minutes. So that's pretty incredible. So we can lower alkalinity with acid and raise the pH from 7 to 7.5 in 30 minutes. So you can actually raise the pH up while you're there on the, on the call. So it is a, uh, a great thing and it's a good tool for you to learn how to use. The other thing I want you to understand is liquid chlorine, liquid bleach, cal hypo, and lithium hypochloride, together called hypochlorides, will not raise the pH of your pool water. And I say not because the end result is it will not raise the pH of your pool water. And I'll show you what happens. Hypochlorides have a pH of, of between 11 and 13. So when you put them in the water, they are going to raise the pH of the pool. So um, before we do that, I want you to understand right here that each of the types of hypochlorites that you add to the pool create hydroxide, the things that are circled. OH is hydroxide, and, and liquid chlorine, calhypo, and lithium hypochlorite all produce um, hydroxyl, hydroxyl or hydroxide in the pool and they raise the pH of the pool. But what happens is the hypochlorite raises uh, the pH of the pool. But when we put chlorine in water, 
it makes HOCl. You all have heard of that. It's called hypochlorous acid, and it is the killing form of chlorine in water. But you also know that hypochlorous acid or chlorine can be destroyed by UV light. So hypochlorous acid plus UV light, when it degrades it, it makes hydrochloric acid, same thing as muriatic acid, and the pH goes down. So you put the chlorine in today, tomorrow when the chlorine gets used up, the pH goes down. And the amount of, of hydroxide that went into the pool to begin with is almost equal to the amount of hydrochloric acid that's made when the hypochlorous acid gets degraded by sunlight or bacteria. So the net difference is just about zero. So the, the thing I want you to realize here is that if the pH of your pool water is always going up, it means two things. Well, probably three things. One is that your total alkalinity in your pool is too high because it's pulling the pH up. The second thing is that if you have a chlorine generator, the pH of your pool is always going to be going up because it makes hydroxide. And the third thing is that if you have very much aeration in your pool from fountains, negative edge, spillways, anything that creates uh, aeration and turbulence in the pool is going to raise the pH of the pool. And so um, it's important for you to know that because if you have a pool that has a great big negative edge all the way around it and a, and a, and a, and a large fall for the water, um, the pH of that pool is going to continuously be going up. So um, we need to know that. And so it's a good tool when we want to adjust it, but it's not necessarily a good thing um, for you when you're trying to take care of it if there's very much turbulence and aeration in the pool, you're always gonna be trying to figure out how to lower the pH. So when we put liquid chlorine in the pool, as you can see, it makes sodium hypochlorite plus water makes hypochlorous acid and sodium hydroxide. Then the hypochlorous acid gets acted upon by UV or bacteria and it makes hydrochloric acid. Sodium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid makes salt. So um, the net pH change in the pool is zero. So it goes up today, but it goes back down tomorrow. And then when you keep adding chlorine, it does the same thing. So um, if the pH in your pool is going up, it's not because of the liquid chlorine you're using. Trichlor and dichlor do lower pH and alkalinity because they have cyanuric acid in them and the chlorine is attached to the cyanuric acid. So when it dissolves, cyanuric acid is released into the pool and that acid will lower pH and alkalinity. So you need to keep a higher alkalinity if you're gonna use uh, trichlor tabs in the pool, but I would not recommend that you use trichlor. I think it builds up cyanuric acid too quickly and then you can have problems. So um, at any rate, outdoor pools lose about one part per million of chlorine each day, even if you have cyanuric acid in the water. So the chlorine loss is 75% in two hours or a complete loss of chlorine in four hours with no cyanuric acid in the pool with as little as 30 parts per million of cyanuric acid in the pool. Um, you keep the, the chlorine in the pool eight times longer, and that's huge. So we need the right amount of cyanuric acid to protect chlorine from sunlight, but not so much that it slows down the killing rate. So residential pools lose about one part per million of chlorine per day, even with cyanuric acid, if they're in the sunlight all day. If they're partially in the shade because there are, are gazebos or overhangs or roofs or something like that, or there are shade trees, um, then the loss is not that much. But it could be as much as a 10 part per million per week use of boring uh, between sunlight 
and bathers, you may have a chlorine loss of up to 10 parts per million per week. And that's something as a service tech, you have to, have to figure out how to do. So the 10 part per million loss could be difficult. And as a result, techs use liquid chlorine and trichlor because it's convenient. You can put it in a floater, or put it in, a, in, a, in an online chlorinator. But the problem is that it builds up cyanuric acid. And the amount of buildup is this way, 10 part per million of chlorine added by trichlor will increase cyanuric acid by six parts per million of cyanuric acid. And six parts per million per week of cyanuric acid increase will increase the amount of free chlorine you need in the pool. And we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes, but it's gonna build up cyanuric acid and the cyanuric acid is gonna end up being a problem. So as a result, there are some things you can do. You could leave some liquid chlorine with the pool owner and at midweek ask him to put in some. Um, many service techs uh, that I've talked to have decided to put in uh, a peristaltic pump like a Rolochem or a, um, a Stenner, one of those, and dispense a little bit of chlorine every day. It's not too difficult to figure out how much liquid chlorine you would need in a, in a 15,000 gallon pool um, to get, say, one part per million of chlorine in the pool every day. Um, fact of the matter is that you're going to need about 15 ounces of liquid chlorine in the pool every day to get one part per million. So you could set a peristaltic pump to come on long enough to pump in a half a quart of acid every day, of uh, chlorine every day, and then they've got some chlorine going into the pool every day. So um, it is possible to do that. However, if you supplement um, liquid chlorine, uh, when you put it in just one time a week with either Cal Hypo, uh, add borate to the pool, use a chlorine generator, ozone, UV, enzymes, or phosphate removers, or even a liquid um, a gravity feeder, um, you can supplement liquid chlorine in that manner. So there are some things that you can do to keep it, and you may not have a 10 part per million loss in a week anyway because of uh, bather lows and whether it's in the shade or not. You know, so, Bob, Bob uh, we've, uh, we've been noticing with the variable speed pumps that we're running them around the clock and they're super efficient. And, um, and by using one of those peristaltic pumps and, and adding it, you know, we get a lot more life out of the uh, liquid bleach in the evening time um, prior to the sun coming up. So it, it, it seems we, when we've got them on the borates, we're saving about 30, 40% of, of the liquid bleach that needs to go into it, but then also keeping that water agitated so things don't puddle and uh, yeah. keeping the water in motion at super low speeds. It's just, it, you know, they're saving electricity, they're saving on chemicals, and they've got much, much better water quality. Yeah, so um, it's a great thing to do. I know uh, John Stanfis, who a lot of us know, um, he's made some videos and stuff on putting a, a roller cam in with a, about a two gallon reservoir and pumping a little bit of, of uh, chlorine in every day. Um, he thinks it's a great way to go. Um, I do too. Um, so uh, anyway, that's one way to get over the hump and to get the liquid chlorine in there because it's not going to be changing anything. You know, the biggest problem with trichlor is that it builds up the cyanuric acid. So increasing cyanuric acid affects the kill rate of chlorine. It increases the free chlorine you need. It lowers pH and alkalinity. It affects the calculation of the saturation index. And then you wonder why um, you start algae growing soon after you start up a pool. And this is what happens is that, that if you've got say 50 parts per million of cyanuric acid in the pool, and you start out with say two parts per million of chlorine in there, you've probably got enough chlorine to prevent algae from growing. But in a month, if we're gonna build up six parts per million of cyanuric acid from using trichlor each week, that means we're going to build up 25 parts per million of cyanuric acid uh, in a month. And so now instead of 50 parts per million, now you've got 75 parts per million. 
And so, and in another month, now you've got 100 parts per million of, of cyanuric acid in the pool. And uh, by calculation, which I'm going to show you in a little bit, um, you will need for each 25 parts per million of chlorine of cyanuric acid you add to the water, you can need one more part per million of free chlorine. So if you were keeping it at two, after a month, you're going to need to keep it at three. And after two months, you're going to need to keep it at four. And even the, the MAHC that some of you have heard about, um, they're now recommending that the ratio of cyanuric acid to chlorine be 20 to 1. And 20 to 1, in layman's terms, is 5%. So your cyanuric acid level determines your chlorine level. And so um, we want to keep the cyanuric acid level down so we don't need a huge amount of chlorine in the pool. So my recommendation is to stop using dry chlor as a primary disinfectant and to limit the maximum to 50 parts per million. And 5% of 50 parts per million is 2.5 parts per million of free chlorine in the pool. So, and even if you go to 60 or 70, you can still get away with, with less than four parts per million. But if cyanuric acid builds up to 150 parts per million, now you need more than seven parts per million of chlorine in the pool to prevent algae and, that, and to prevent bacteria too. So, um, it's wise to keep the cyanuric acid level down and to keep this, the chlorine level at 5% of the cyanuric acid level. Okay, so a lot of you want to know about borates for pools, and I tend to be the borate guy. Um, it, it does two things in pools, and it does it really well. That is, it keeps the pH from going up, and so if the pH in your pools is always going up, even if the alkalinity is where it should be, you need to get some borate in there. It's, it will not stop it from going up, but it will prevent it from going up as fast, and it will take less acid to get it back down. The second thing is it prevents algae. It is technically what's called an algae stack. And what it means is it prevents it, but it doesn't kill it. So um, it will not work as an algicide if you have algae in the pool and you put borate in, it's not going to kill it. But if, if algae are introduced into the pool, algae will, the borate will kill it as it's introduced, so, or prevent it at least. It won't kill it, I guess is the wrong way to say it. It prevents it from replicating. And so by not being able to, to produce more of its own, it essentially dies. So um, that's the way it works. And it saves between 30 and 50% in chlorine use. So the water will also feel a little silkier, it'll look a little bluer, and it will sparkle if you put borates in pools. Uh, John uh, Stankus has made a few videos and show you where he puts borate into the pool. And you can actually see in the video as he pours in the the borate, the water starts to sparkle a little more than, than it did before we put it in. So you can actually see a better sparkle in the pool uh, by using borate. You only have to add it once, and then you add it again after there's been a huge water loss. So if you have a salt water chlorine generator in your pool, uh, you need a little bit higher hey, level of Robert. Chlorine. Yes. Um, one other thing that I find with borates, that it's, it's a nice sort of charm to it. It's also a non-corrosive, which means the ladders and rails and light rings tend to stay a little bit brighter for a lot longer. Oh, that's cool. That's great. Um, a lot of that has to do with, with uh, keeping the pH uh, in the proper range as well. And, and with borate and cyanuric acid and alkalinity in the proper levels, then you don't get into corrosive water. But um, they are great for a saltwater chlorine generator. And one of the reasons is it keeps the pH from going up so high, so there's less calcium carbonate scaling on the plates of the, of the generator. Um, and keeping 70 parts per million borate lowers the free chlorine requirement in the pool. Um, so 
that all translates into less runtime for the, the saltwater chlorine generator. And chlorine generators, their life, uh, their life expectancy is based on how many hours they run. So if you run it less to keep a lower, uh, to, to maintain a chlorine level, then you're going to extend the life of the, of the chlorine generator. So here are the water conditions with using a saltwater chlorine generator. You may want to take a snapshot of this screen um, so that you can have it because it's not in that book and it is something that we've added uh, extra that's not in the book. But we keep the pH between 7.5 and 7.7, uh, alkalinity between 80 and 90, cyanuric acid between 70 and 80, borate between 60 and 70, calcium hardness between 350 and 400, salt level, whatever the recommended by the manufacturer. Um, the TDS of 1500 plus the salt, plus whatever you started at, the free chlorine level between three and four parts per million, which is 5% of cyanuric acid, and a saturation index of negative 0.3 to positive 0.5. And these are the best water conditions for a saltwater chlorine generator. So borate as an algostat, borate does not remove CO2 from the water. And even if it did remove CO2, um, algae could get, by, could get CO2 from bicarb when it's added or from the alkalinity that's already in the pool. Borate disrupts the cell wall development, disrupts metabolism, and disrupts cell division. So it prevents algae by doing that, but it doesn't kill it. So one of the chemicals that you can add to the pool is called borax. Borax and not boraxo, which by the way is soap. Um, borax is sodium tetraborate decahydrate, which means it has 10 molecules of water with it. And when you add it to the pool, you add 11.785 ounces to 10,000 gallons, and that gives you one part per million of boron in the pool. So 50 parts per million is 15 times 11.785, and that gives you 589 ounces or about 37 pounds of borax into your pool to get 50 parts per million of uh, boron uh, or borate. However, borax has a pH of 9.2, so it's gonna raise the pH of your pool up to about nine. It's also going to increase alkalinity by 115 parts per million. So in order to uh, compensate or get back to where you started, um, you need to add 2.1 fluid ounces of muriatic acid per one ounce of borax that you use. And so uh, in this, this 10,000 gallon pool that we added 37 pounds of borate to, we're gonna have to add 2.2 gallons of muriatic acid to lower the pH and the alkalinity back to where we started. But once you do that, it will then prevent the pH and the alkaline, or pH from going up. The alkalinity will remain where it was. So, another chemical that's popular for adding borate to the pool is called sodium tetraborate pentahydrate, penta meaning five molecules of water with it. Um, adding nine ounces to 10,000 gallons will increase the boron rate in the pool by one part per million. So in a 10,000 gallon pool, we would need 28 pounds. Um, and the pH of this is also 9.2, and it will raise alkalinity by 115 parts per million. So again, we will need to add uh, muriatic acid to get it back down, and you will need about 2.2 gallons of muriatic acid per 10,000 gallons to get the alkalinity and the pH back down to where you started. Another chemical that's added, and this is the one I recommend using, is called boric acid. And adding 7.64 ounces per 10,000 gallons will increase borate in the pool by 50 parts per million. So 300, uh, 50 times 7.64 
is 382 ounces. If you divide that by 16, we get 24 pounds. So you need a little less of it, and it will not change the pH of the alkalinity. It changed the pH of the pool or the alkalinity by very much. It changes pH by 0.2 and changes alkalinity by, by, an a, by minus five parts per million, which won't even show up on your kit. So um, you put it in and you don't have to do anything. So um, uh, it's why I recommend using this, but you just put it in and you don't have to do anything else. Um, there Testing. is another... Testing, test. method, the testing methods, um, Bob, as far as I, I think test strips are now available through Taylor, through Yes, uh, that's actually on the next screen. Okay. So you add 50 parts per million or 70 parts per million if you have a, a saltwater chlorine generator. You add it once, maybe check it once a month or, or when you drain some water. There are test strips that are available by Lamont, ITS, Hawk, and Taylor. Um, Pool stores in California um, have been legal to sell uh, borates since 2017. Technically, they've always been able to sell borates in, in, in California, except one company decided to make a claim that it killed algae on their label, and that required them to comply with California EPA laws, which they did in August of 2017. So if you hear that borate or boron products are illegal to use in California or anywhere else, that's not true. So borate is allowed. Um, it has a maximum level by EPA of uh, 50 parts per million with a level of concern of 1.5. Um, and what this means is that, that there is a toxicity, but toxicity is a strange subject. And when you talk about toxicity, uh, there's a number of things you have to consider. Is it oral, is it dermal, is it inhalation? So the method of getting into your, into your body comes into play. The second thing is, how much do you consider something that will cause a problem? So, you know, if we say the toxicity is 50 parts per million, does that mean if, if you drink 51 parts per million, you will die? Absolutely not. Um, so in order to have any serious problem with borate in water, a human would need to consume five grams of pure, of pure boric acid or pure tetraborate. And that amount in a pool at 50 parts per million, you would need to drink 100 liters of water. 100 liters of water is about 26 gallons of pool water. And dogs are four times more sensitive than people, so they would need to drink about six gallons of pool water. And that would be a one day consumption. And the reason I say that is because boron is excreted by your body daily. So it does not bioaccumulate, it doesn't stay in your body, and so every time you pee, you pee some boron out. So if you didn't pee all day long, and you drank 26 gallons of pool water, you might, have, you might have a problem. So the idea that a dog is gonna die from drinking some pool water is not true because they eliminate boron every day just like we do. And so they, each day they would have to consume a total of six gallons and not pee. So chances of that happening are pretty slim, but I do need to mention that there is a toxicity just to be legal. So you know, so now you know. There's also a toxicity, by the way, on cyanuric acid of 100 parts per million. And how many pools out there have more than 100 parts per million of cyanuric acid? So we don't obey that law either. So um, at any rate, it's there. And you can buy borax and wash your clothes in it. Boric acid is actually used in eye drops. It's used in nail fungus remedies. And it's used in ear drops and it's actually used in wound care. Also, don't confuse borate with bromate. Bromates are cancer causing, but they are not formed from borates. They are formed from bromine. 
So um, anyway, uh, that's the information on borates. If you want some more technical information, I have written four, excuse me, five uh, technical bulletins about borates. And they are available on my website for free at www.pcti.online. The, the bulletins that you see there, including one in Spanish, is available from my website. You can read it online or download it free as a PDF. Um, so it is available and all of the really technical information that you wanna see is the one that's in the middle of the screen at the bottom. Bori changes to pH, total alkalinity, TDS, and acid to neutralize per 10,000 gallons. There's a whole table full of information available for you on using borates. I recommend them. I think you should use them. Okay, so predicting, yes. Bob, I got a quick question. Uh, after, or I should say on a startup, what, how long do you recommend uh, holding out on adding borates to that? Or do you have a borate startup procedure? Actually, believe it or not, I have a borate startup procedure. And that same website that has the technical bulletins also has a nine page borate startup method that you can use. And believe it or not, I guess it's a little bit serendipitous, but the programmer I have in England, in uh, India, that makes my um, uh, apps for cell phones, he has told me that later today, he will be sending the program over to me for beta testing for a, an app for a borate startup method. So you will be able to go to your pool and use the app to add all the chemicals you need to start up a pool. And it's a pretty cool uh, app, and I'm really looking forward to having it on the market. So um, pretty soon there will be a borate startup method uh, app that you can use to start up a pool. You do a day, you come back to the app and do the second day, you come back to the app and do the third day, and it tells you each day the amount of chemicals you need for, for that pool. And then it saves all the records so you can go back and look at it um, in case you need to legally do something. So it's pretty cool and you should um, probably buy it as soon as I get it offered. <laughs> hey, anyway, Bob. Th thanks, for the, thanks for the tip. Bob, Joey yeah. here. Uh, yeah. just, a, just a food for thought and just sort of uh, because I've done it and made the mistake of doing it and regretted the heck out of it, Make sure your chemistry in these pools you're putting borates in is where you want it to begin with because the borates are such a good buffer that if something's out of line, it's really, really, really tough to get it back to where you want it. Yeah, it's true. And, and I, I want to mention a couple of other things. Thanks, Joey, for the little um, reminder. Um, there are a couple of things with borates. One of the things, the first thing is that if you're going to use the products that are not acidic, you're going to use something other than boric acid. Re realize that the pH of your water is going to go to nine. So if, you're, if you have a high level of calcium in the water, if you have metals in the pool, when you add it, the pH is going up and you run the risk of causing a stain or scale in the pool. Even though it's going to be short time, um, you need to, to realize that the pH is going to go high and you could get some scaling or some staining due to high metals. So, but also realize that you can put in the, the borates into the pool and start putting in the muriatic acid that you need right away. So you can al almost put them in together. It's okay. Um, the other thing is, to make sure you broadcast the stuff around the pool and not let it pile up on the bottom. If it piles up a little bit, you wanna brush it around with a, with a, uh, a brush or even use like, the, uh, like a hammerhead without the back and run it over where you've dumped in the, the, uh, the borate and have it, have it uh, kind of mix it up in the pool for you. So you wanna get it mixed up. But bear in mind that if you've got metals, high 
uh, calcium levels, you could potentially have a problem. So thanks for the reminder, Joey. All right, so as most of you know, there is a way to predict if the water is balanced, corrosive, or scale forming, and it's using the uh, Langelier Saturation Index. And um, the Langelier Saturation Index is actually based on calcium carbonate saturation. And it's a mathematical equation, which is on your screen, which most people won't be able to understand, but um, except for a few eggheads like me. But in any case, there is a mathematical formula that you need. And it's a mathematical formula, it's not a bunch of tables. What they've done is take this and make some tables from it. But there is an actual way to calculate the real saturation index, and I use that. But if you keep the water at the conditions that we've suggested for targets level, you won't even need to keep, uh, you won't even need to calculate the saturation index, but you can. So there are other indices around. There's a riser index, the Pucorius index, the Hamilton index, which wasn't really an index and didn't really work, but there is a calcium carbonate precipitation potential and the calcite saturation index. But we're going to stick with the LSI, the saturation, the Langelier saturation index. Originally, it used five water test values, pH, hardness, alkalinity, TDS, and temperature plugged into a formula um, that gave you a number. And the goal was to, to get a 0, 0.00 uh, saturation index. You need a minimum calcium level of 150 parts per million. With most plaster pools, you will need a recommended level of 350, and for vinyl, fiberglass, acrylic, and so on, 250. But the new LSI uses six water conditions. So the same five that we talked about, plus cyanuric acid and borate. And we subtract a factor for cyanuric acid and borate away from the total alkalinity to get what's called um, carbonate alkalinity. So the goal is to find carbonate alkalinity and plug that into our formula. So the formula itself um, uses factors. So pH is used as is. Calcium is a factor that you look up in a table. Total alkalinity is total alkalinity minus a factor for cyanuric acid, and temperature is a factor. We add all of those together and then subtract a factor for a total dissolved solids. And so the goal then is to have 0, 0.00 or as low as minus 0.3 or as high as 0, 0.5 to be considered balanced. So you really don't need to do anything to the water if it's between there. Um, however, as it gets a little bit higher and a little bit higher, you want to take a look at it. And as it starts to creep lower and lower, you want to start considering making some adjustments to the water to keep it back closer to zero, zero. So you test the water and record the results. Then you look up each one of the parts per million you look up a factor for that and then plug it back into that equation. So um, uh, we plug those back into the equation. Here is an example. We take pH of 7.5, it's used as is. So the factor isn't, it's just 7.5. Calcium hardness was 300. If you go look up 300 parts per million on the table, you will find it's 2.1. Total alkalinity is 100. And normally, if you weren't going to make the adjustment for cyanuric acid, you will go look up 100. But with cyanuric acid in the pool, we need to make an adjustment. And the adjustment says that we take uh, 0.32 times the cyanuric acid level and subtract that from alkalinity. So in this case, we have a cyanuric acid level of 90, 
and we're going to, I'm sorry, a cyanuric acid level of, of 150, and that should be down at the bottom. I've made a mistake here. It should say 150 for cyanuric acid. But the adjustment is 150 times 0.32, which is 48. Take 48 parts per million from 100 parts per million, and the new number we need to go look up is 52 parts per million, which is 1.7. Then we use a factor for, upper, uh, for temperature, which is 0.65. We add it all up and get 1195. Subtract a TDS of 1200 from it, which is 12.2. We actually have a saturation in the index, which is minus 0.25. And so this is something that, that if we didn't make that adjustment, you would think that the, the saturation index is okay because it would only be uh, a positive 0.05. But with the adjustment for 150 parts per million of cyanuric acid, it's actually corrosive water. And so we, it's important that you see that. And so there is an adjustment also to uh, total alkalinity for cyanuric acid. And as you can see over on the left, um, the adjustment to total alkalinity for 50 parts per million of, of uh, borate in the water is pretty small when it's down about a uh, pH of 7.5, it's only a change of six parts per million. But as you get up to eight, now it's a change of 17 parts per million. At 8.2, it's 25 parts per million change from total alkalinity. And over on the left is the table M that is from the Taylor book uh, on adjusting total, total alkalinity for borate. So um, you can see that, that there is a change and you need to start um, adjusting to carbonate alkalinity if you're gonna use the saturation index. So in this case, what we've done is we take the 48 uh, parts per million adjustment here for um, uh, cyanuric acid, and then there's a borate adjustment also. So now we go look up 46 parts per million instead of 100, and it's still 1.7, but if you actually use the mathematical equation, which is used in the NPC LSI calculator, you would find that you now have water that has a negative 0.32 instead of what you thought was a positive 0.05. So we went from almost perfect water to, to fairly corrosive water because we have uh, cyanuric acid and borate in the, in the water and we need to get back to uh, carbonate alkalinity to make that adjustment. Okay. So if you use the calculator, um, you would end up with um, a better idea of what the saturation index. And there is the calculator over there. Um, it's a great little uh, thing that you may want to consider purchasing for $5.99 one-time purchase. Um, here is the, uh, the app, and I'll show you, I think this will work on our screen. Um, we, it's probably not going to work. Okay. No, it's not working. So I thought that we'd be, oh, it is working, sorry. So you can save the records. Um, you can see that the, uh, as we change the, the pH to 7.2 with an alkalinity, um, uh, of 100, now we have acceptable water, but it's still negative. And if we change the alkalinity a little farther down, uh, in this case, uh, we change alkalinity from 100 down to 60. Now you can see that this area changes to red, and so we have corrosive water. Um, you can look up the records by date or by name, and it will give you the calculations, and it will save as many records as your phone has memory for. So you can go look them up um, and see what uh, any of the conditions were on any of your pools. You can also download this as a uh, CVS file to your um, 
computer and then use them in Excel. So you can adjust them that way as well. Okay, so the relationship between the LSI and some water conditions, um, I thought it would be interesting to see how much of a change uh, each of some of the conditions do to the LSI. And so changing the LSI by one takes a pH change of 0.1. Calcium hardness takes about 100 parts per million to make a change by 0.1. TDS makes 1,500 parts per million, changes it by only 0.1. Total alkalinity, change 20 parts per million, changes it by 0.1. Cyanuric acid by 70 and temperature by 15. But it is important to remember that if you, the temperature goes from 85 or 90 degree water in the summertime to 60 degree water, um, you're going to be changing the LSI by minus 0.2 or maybe even minus 0.3. So um, that's important. You could have water that's not corrosive in the summer, but corrosive in the winter. So it's important to know that. Okay, so um, the Langelier saturation index is affected by, by things, things going high and things going low. And the goal is to keep it as close to zero as you can. So deciding which condition to change, uh, the first thing possibly to look at is you need a minimum of 150 parts per million of uh, carbonate alkalinity. So uh, I'm sorry, of 150 parts per million of calcium. So you need the minimum level of 150 to be able to balance the pool. And slightly positive is better than negative. Some conditions are not easily changed and we want to stop using trichlor because the, the uh, cyanuric acid level builds up and then it requires an adjustment for um, free chlorine as well as changing the saturation index calculation. So um, targets are better than PHTA guidelines. So the targets are better. But first thing to consider is anything that's going to, to cause us to drain some water from the pool. So if the, if the calcium hardness is greater than 400, maybe 500, uh, we probably should drain some water and fill it back up. Um, there are some calcium hardness reducers on the market, but I've not had very good success with, with using them. Um, cyanuric acid, if the cyanuric acid level is very high, if it's more than 50, consider partial draining is greater than 100, definitely consider draining the pool. And um, uh, you may want to drain about 50% of it to get the cyanuric acid level down, or even more, uh, depending on what the cyanuric acid level is. If the cyanuric acid level is 150, you may want to drain 75% of the pool. So um, alkalinity is on this list because sometimes um, it's easier to trade some water than for water that has um, a low alkalinity in it than it is to be adding acid to the pool. So sometimes. Also sequestering agents or copper iron in the water. Um, if the copper iron level is very high, you may want to drain some water and fill it back up. That way the copper is gone from the pool. Understand that a sequestering agent in the, added to the water surrounds the dissolved metal in the water with the sequestrant. And so it only, the metal is still in the water, is just being prevented from causing a stain. And that sequestrant can be oxidized by sunlight, non-chlorine shock, and by chlorine, and it can eventually go away. And when it does, the metal can come back in the water. So you have to use a sequestering agent on a regular basis um, to keep the, the copper and iron from coming out of the water. It's probably better if you use a pre-filter or use one of those bag filters that you can put in the skimmer that will remove the metal from the water instead of just surrounding it. So um, 
those are recommendations for the things that could cause you to drain um, the pool. After that, and how much water do you need to drain? There is a formula for doing it, and it's not too difficult. You use the part per million that's in the pool, you use it twice. Um, you take the part per million of the condition that's in, in the pool minus the target, minus what you're looking for. And you divide that by the part per million of the condition in the pool minus the, the part per million of the condition in your source water. And so explaining it is a little more difficult than actually doing it. If we had 600 parts per million of hardness in the pool and we want 350 and the source water has 150 in it, here's how you calculate it. You take 600 parts per million in the pool minus the 350 that you want. And then you take 600 parts per million in the pool divided by 150 that's in your source water. And you divide one with the other and you end up needing to drain 55% of that pool and fill it back up. And when you do, you'll have 350 parts per million of calcium in the pool. So it's pretty easy math, but people today don't want to do the math the long way. They're looking for the short way. Okay, so the short way is that there's actually a, an app for that that I made. And you can plug the numbers into an app and get the, the adjustment. So what do you change next? We change the calcium hardness, we change borate, we add cyanuric acid. So that gives us what we need. Once we make the adjustments, we can adjust pH and alkalinity using acid and aeration, and that will get our pH and our alkalinity where it needs to be. So raising pH without raising alkalinity. <clears throat> this um, illustration shows the equilibrium of CO2 in the air with, with CO2 in the water. And they are in equilibrium. But CO2 in the water is also in equilibrium with carbonic acid in the water. And carbonic acid is in equilibrium with bicarbonate in the water. And bicarbonate is in equilibrium with carbonate in the water. So the carbonate ion is in equilibrium with bicarbonate. So all of these things are in equilibrium. And if we re remove any of them, everything else has to switch around to make up for that loss. So here is uh, the same aeration graphic showing number one where we aerate the water and CO2 leaves the water. So CO2 leaves the water and the CO2 is replaced from carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid is replaced from bicarbonate ion, and the bicarbonate ion is replaced from carbonate ion. And in the process, it uses up a hydrogen ion. And the less hydrogen ion in the water, the higher the pH. pH is a measure of hydrogen ion in the water. Less hydrogen ion equals a higher pH. So as we aerate, we lose hydrogen ions and the pH goes up. And this is the chemical explanation of exactly what happens in the water. So creating the turbulence, we can create it with a compressor and an air stone. We can create it with um, a manifold attached to the return line. We can um, lower it, or, or I mean uh, raise pH by using a submersible pump um, and discharge the, the uh, water into the air and have it splice down into the pool. And, and I've told people earlier, if you've just joined us, I've done this in a 15,000 gallon pool and at a submersible pump that pumps 100 gallons a minute, in a 15,000 gallon pool, we raise the pH of the pool from 7.0 to 7.5 in 30 minutes. And it did not change the alkalinity. So um, this is important for you to get this because it's a tool you can use to balance your pools. 
You add acid to get the alkalinity down to the proper level, which will probably make your pH too low. Then you can aerate the pool and use this method and bring only the pH back up and you can have perfect water in your pool today. Not add some acid and come back next week and see what it did, but we can balance the pool while you're there on your 30 or 40 minute call today. So it is possible that there are nine possible co combinations in the pool and you can use a combination of baking soda, acid and air to accomplish each of them. Um, I have said that you can add soda ash when pH and alkalinity are both low. And that's true, that will work. But you can also add bicarb and aerate and it'll bring the pH, in, it'll bring the pH right back up. So we can use um, aeration, uh, bicarb, acid, and air under any condition in the pool and get exactly what we need to balance the pool. There's also been a myth around since I got into the pool industry 47 years ago that pouring acid around the pool lowers the pH and pouring acid in the column lowers alkalinity. And I'm here to tell you it's BS, it doesn't work, it's not true. So adding acid, however you add it to the pool does exactly the same thing. It doesn't change, change it by how you add it. It can, if you add it in one spot, you can actually do a mini acid wash on that spot. If you pour it in one spot and the acid gets down to the bottom, um, it can actually uh, uh, dissolve some of that pool right where you're pouring it. So it's not a good idea to pour it in a column anyway. Pour it over the return line or pour it while you're walking around the pool. Okay, so the old method of adjusting water balance. So the problem is that you have a high pH and high alkalinity. And the old way was to add a quart or two of acid, wait for it to mix and retest it to see what it did. And that's just, that was 60 years ago they did that. So um, if you do that, what you're going to find is if the pH is okay, now your alkalinity is going to be high. And if you added enough acid to get the pH to where it is, now the pH will be, a, be okay, but the output, I mean, now the alkalinity will be okay, but the pH will be too low. So it really doesn't work and you don't know what you're doing anyway. The second method is to use an acid demand test. And you, you do the test, you count the, the drops, you look up how many drops you will use and look that up by gallons and it tells you how much acid to add. But all that does is make the pH 7.5. It doesn't tell you what's going to happen to your alkalinity. So it doesn't predict any alkalinity. It doesn't tell you. So um, then if, if the pH is 7.5, your alkalinity is still too high. If you add acid, your pH is going to go even lower. Or if you add some soda ash to get the, the pH back up, the pH is going to go back up and so is your alkalinity. So it's not going to work. So that way it doesn't work either. The best method of adding uh, acid and dealing with the high pH and alkalinity is to add enough acid to lower the alkalinity to the target of 90 parts per million and then aerate. And here's how you can calculate that dose. It's 2.56 fluid ounces will in 10,000 gallons will lower total alkalinity by one. So this means that from that, we can figure out exactly how much acid we need to lower the alkalinity in a pool. We subtract 90 from the current alkalinity to get the decrease in PPM. We divide the pool gallons by 10,000 gallons to get a gallon factor. And then we multiply 2.5 ticks times the gallon factor times the decrease. And here's the example, 15,000 gallon pool with an alkalinity of 160. We take 160 minus 90, and that gives us 70. We take 15,000 divided by 10,000, and that gives us 1.5. So now we've got all three numbers, 2.56 fluid ounces times 1.5 times 70 gives us 268 
0.8 fluid ounces. We divide that by 128 fluid ounces in a gallon, and we get 2.1 gallons of acid. So if we add 2.1 gallons of acid to this 15,000 gallon pool, the alkalinity is going down by 70. And that's absolutely true. So it gives us a way to do it. And what's going to happen then is that when we add that, the, out, the pH is going to go low. And what you will find is that the pH will be down around 6.4 or 6.5. But if we just simply aerate and cause turbulence by the ways that I've shown you, the pH will start to go up right away. So we can actually add the acid and start the, the, the aeration and turbulence and then do the rest of the maintenance on the pool. And somewhere between a half an hour and about two hours, the pH is going to be 7.5 and the alkalinity is going to be 90. So we've balanced this pool in a very short period of time. Sometimes you can do it right while you're there on a 45 minute call. So um, it's possible, depending on how low the alkalinity goes and how much aeration you cause, to be able to balance it while you're there. And that's a whole lot better than from week to week. So bicarb will, in uh, 10,000 gallons of pool water, will raise alkalinity by 7.1. And it will only raise up pH by 0 0.03. So sodium bicarb does not raise the pH of a pool, unless the pH is really, really low. Sodash, on the other hand, one pound in 10,000 gallon raises total alkalinity by 11, and it will raise pH, depending on what the starting pH is, by 0.3 when it's 7, by 0.5 when it's 7.2, and by, by 0.85 when the pH is 7.4. So Sodash has a great impact on, on, on pH. Um, and alkalinity, but bicarb only changes um, alkalinity. Muriatic acid, on the other hand, it will lower total alkalinity by, by uh, 10 parts per million if you use 25.6, or one part per million if you use 2.56. It lowers pH and total alkalinity, and it lowers it by varying amounts depending on the starting pH. The pH is eight, it'll lower alkalinity by uh, pH by 0.5. If your starting pH is 7.8, it'll lower it by 0.4. If your pH is 7.6, it'll lower it by 0.3. So um, it lowers pH and alkalinity by differing amounts depending on the starting pH and alkalinity. There is an app for that. And basically uh, you put in pH alkalinity um, cyanuric acid and borate and give it a new desired pH and it will tell you the new alkalinity and how much acid you need to do that. And I think this is also a, a uh, has a video with it. If you, if you put in, uh, for instance, a pool volume of 15,000 gallons, put in a current pH, well, you select either imperial or metric, um, put in a, a pH value currently of 7.8, a cyanuric acid level of say 50, a borate level of say zero, current alkalinity of say 160, 140. It will tell you the desire and put in a new desired pH of 7.2. It will tell you need alkalinity, the new alkalinity will be 127. If you change the pH down to a pH of 6.5, the new alkalinity will be 108 and a different amount of acid. If you change the pH down to 6.5, you'll have a new alkalinity of 88. You'll need 201 fluid ounces of, of acid. So um, you can see that we can get uh, any alkalinity we want by changing the pH lower and lower on the app. So this is a great app, a great tool. It's a one-time purchase of $5.99. $5 there's no ads, there's no in, 
there's no in-app purchases. It's not a subscription. You own it. Um, you can also use this just to show you that, that my heart's in the right place. There are free versions of this app and the other two apps on my website at LowryCG.com or on the PCTI website. You can use both of these apps for free on the website. But if you want to use it on your phone and use it at poolside, um, you can buy the app and use it on your phone. Um, there also is an app to know how much of each chemical to add. Um, you put in the pool volume, uh, whether you want metric or imperial, what you want to change. Um, we'll do a short video on this one quickly. Um, if you put in a 15,000 gallon pool, you decide on, on imperial or metric. Um, you put in what you want to change. In this case, we're going to change chlorine. Uh, we want to add perhaps five parts per million of chlorine to the pool. Um, when you look at the chemical dose amount, it will list 12 different chemicals that you can add to the pool and how much each one of them you will need to get five parts per million. Um, if you want to change something else, um, you go up to the item to change, change uh, perhaps the alkalinity, you want to raise it. Uh, you want to raise it by 40 parts per million. You plug that in and it gives you three chemicals that you could add to change the alkalinity in that pool. If you want to add borate to the pool, for instance, you add 50 parts per million of borate to the pool. Um, it will give you the amounts of all three chemicals you need to add to the pool to change borate by 50 parts per million. It's another tool in your toolbox and it's probably worth uh, worth you purchasing. So um, we've talked a few times about adjusting uh, pH up and down. Um, I just want to remember that this same method of raising pH will also raise pH when you don't want it to, which means if you have fountains, if you have spillovers, if you have negative edge pools, those type of things, all of those are going to create uh, turbulence and aeration, and it's going to raise the pH of your pool when you don't want it to be raised. Some guy showed me a, a picture of a great pool he built, had a 360 degree negative edge. And I thought, boy, are you going to be in trouble trying to keep the pH in your pool? Because it's going to go up all the time. So just be aware that any of these things, we can use them, but they can also be a potential problem if you have a lot of them in a pool. Okay, I told you there was an app for draining, and it's quite a simple app. You put the condition in the pool. Uh, for instance, we put in 600 parts per million of hardness in the pool. We want it to be 350 in the pool. The fill water has a, a level in it of 150 parts per million. And when we hit the, the, the go, the return button, it will tell us we need to, to drain 56% of the pool. So um, it's a, a great uh, way to know how much of a pool to drain to get exactly what you need in the pool. So adjust water conditions to the target and not for the saturation index. Um, Greg Garrett, who's no longer with us, and he was my partner at PCTI, called me one day from a a commercial pool in Nevada. And he said, listen, I got a pool that has a pH of 7.4 with 200,000 gallons, pH 7.4, total alkalinity 80, cyanuric acid 150, calcium hardness 350, TDS of 950, and a temperature of 80. The LSI is a negative 46. We got a negative 0.46. The corrosion is big. And we got a problem in this pool. And so I was thinking about just raising the total alkalinity to 140. And if I do, I'll have an LSI of, of almost exactly 0, 0.00. And I said, Greg, you will, but here's the problem. The pH is going to be unstable because with a, a, an alkalinity of 140, the pH in this pool is going to continually go up. And so you're going to have to add acid and acid and acid 
to get it back down. And so you're going to be fighting a pH because now you have a, a nice LSI, but now you're going to fight the pool. So it's better to low, and in, in addition, 150 parts per million would require 7.5 parts per million of free chlorine. I'm sorry, 11.5. 11.25 parts per million of free chlorine in the pool um, to keep algae from growing. So it's better in this pool if we drain some water, lower the cyanuric acid to 50 parts per million, raise the pH up to 7.5, raise total alkalinity to 90, and put 50 parts per million of borate in the pool. Now the whole pool's stable. You got a nice LX, LSI, and we don't have any corrosion. You're going to save money on chlorine in the pool. I said it's a better deal. So it's better to adjust it to the proper standards instead of just keep believing that an LSI of zero zero is all you need. Because it may be all you need, but it may not make for taking care of the pool very easy. So, and here's what I wanted you to understand about two parts per million to four parts per million of chlorine in the pool. That's the PHTA guideline for chlorine in your pool. Want to understand something from the research that I've done and that Richard Falk has done, the level of HOCl needed to kill algae is only 0.05 parts per million. And algae are harder to kill than bacteria. So if we kill the algae, we automatically kill most bacteria. 30 parts per million of cyanuric acid in the pool, 97% of all the chlorine is bound to cyanuric acid. This means only three parts per million, 3% of the chlorine that's in the pool is available to kill algae and bacteria. That's important. When chlorine gets in the pool, HOCl is created according to this reaction. So the result of adding chlorine to the pool, we make HOCl and OCO. And the killing form of chlorine is HOCl. And OCl is in the water, but it's a poor disinfectant. It's not very good. And we say it mostly doesn't kill anything. But the pH of the water determines how much OCl and HOCl we have in the pool. And as you can see, as the pH goes up, the amount of HOCl goes down. At a pH of 7.5, we have just about 50-50. We got about 50 parts of 50 uh, percent of the of all the chlorine in the water is HOCl and 50 percent is OCl. So the level of HOCl needed to kill chlorine to kill algae is only 0.5 parts per million. 30, part, 30 parts per million of cyanuric acid, 97% of all the chlorine bound to cyanuric acid, only 3% available to kill algae and bacteria. So we can do the math. And here is the math. Only 1.5% of the free chlorine that's in the water is HOCl. So if we multiply two parts per million of free chlorine times 1.5%, we only have 0.03 parts per million HOCl. That's not enough HOCl to kill algae. If we take three parts per million of free chlorine and multiply it times 1.5%, we have 0 0.05 parts per million HOCl. And that would be almost enough to kill algae, very close. And at four parts per million times 1.5%, we would have 0.06 parts per million HSCL, and that for sure is enough to kill algae. So you can see by doing the math that we can actually have two parts per million of free chlorine in the pool, and it's not going to kill all the algae. It'll kill some of it, but it's not going to kill it all. And eventually there'll be enough algae that you really won't have enough chlorine. So um, we can calculate this. But instead of calculating it for each pool, what I've done is reverse it and say we can use a, a, a percentage of cyanuric acid. But I want you to see this graphic about 
bound and unbound chlorine. And as I said, 3% of the chlorine is available and 97% is not available right now. But understand that as some of that 3% of the free chlorine in the water is used, some of the 97 replaces it. And it keeps that, that ratio of 97% and 3%, it maintains that. So as we have 97% of the chlorine that's bound to cyanuric acid and 3% that's unbound, and of that unbound chlorine, only 1.5% is, is as, as HOCl. But as some of the HOCl is used, the, it, it gets replaced by the unbound or the 97%. And as the amount of chlorine gets smaller, that ratio of 97% to 3% is maintained until all the chlorine is gone. So the 97% is not locked up and not available. It's only available in 3% of, at a time. And that's enough to kill um, uh, algae and bacteria are killed at that level. So we need to maintain it high enough that we've always got 0 0.05 parts per million HOCl in the water. And you do that by doing the math or maintaining a free chlorine level of 7.5% of cyanuric acid. So at 50 parts per million, you actually need 3.75 parts per million of free chlorine in the pool. And if you don't maintain that, you're gonna have algae growing. So, and at 80 parts per million of cyanuric acid, you would need six. And at 150 parts per million, you need 11. So, but the EPA says the maximum PPM for chlorine is four parts per million. So what can you do? Lower cyanuric acid back down. But understand that if we're gonna put borate in the pool, we can change the 7.5% to 5%. So it's important to understand that. It's also important because swimmers, homeowners, are concerned about exposure to chlorine. And at two parts per million of chlorine in the pool, with no cyanuric acid, bathers are exposed to two parts per million of free chlorine. If you have three parts, of, I'm sorry, if you have 30 parts per million of cyanuric acid in the pool, or 20 parts per million, the exposure is only 3% of the free chlorine in the pool. So the exposure to chlorine is only 0.06 parts per million with uh, cyanuric acid in the pool. So bathers are exposed to less chlorine with cyanuric acid in the pool. Understand that. So if we put borate in the pool, we can change the free chlorine requirement to 5%. So borate is a buffer and we use 50 parts per million in the pool. It's also an algostat. So because it prevents algae from getting started in the pool, we can lower the free chlorine level that's required from 7.5% to 5%. So then, even if we have 100 parts per million of cyanuric acid in the pool, we can maintain five parts per million of free chlorine and not have any algae growth. So, it's important to, that you understand that. So borate is a good thing for two good reasons. It's a buffer and it's an algostat and it lowers the amount of free chlorine you need in your pool. So there are generic uh, calculators that you can use that'll make your jobs easier in the pool. Um, you can buy all of them for less than 20 bucks and own them forever. And um, I would recommend that you that you get these apps, they will help you uh, to maintain pools. Um, the takeaways from what we've done today are that the target conditions are better than the, the PHTA guidelines. We could use aeration and turbulence uh, to raise pH in the pool without changing alkalinity. We know that cyanuric acid 
and total alkalinities are buffers to prevent the pH from going lower, from decreasing. And borate is a buffer to prevent the pH from going up. Liquid chlorine does not raise pH. Cyanuric acid should not be more than 50 parts per million in the pool unless you've got a chlorine generator, in which case we could go to 70. Cyanuric acid builds up quickly in pools that are using trichlor um, and requires a, a higher free chlorine level to, to maintain, uh, to control bacteria and algae. The chlorine level in the pool should be 7.5% of cyanuric acid without borate in there. If we're going to use borate in the pool at 50 parts per million, the chlorine level should be 5% of cyanuric acid. And all of this information, there is a great source uh, for all of this information and more in this 228 page book that was written last year, uh, published last year. Uh, the book can be purchased as an ebook on uh, Amazon or as a print version that you can get in two days. Um, it's a great book to own. Uh, keep it in your in your place as a as a um, uh, as a Bible, so you can refer to things and understand it. Um, you should also get a copy of um, the Pool Chemistry for Service Pros, which is a literally a printed version of everything we've talked about today. Um, that book is also available in Spanish. Um, and it's the same price, and it is an ebook or a print copy version as well. Many service techs have taken this book and just keep it in their truck. Um, this book and this method are, they work. And I can tell you they work because this book, we have now distributed more than 12,000 copies of this book. So um, it is a great book. It is a great way to take care of a pool. And I'm not trying to sell you any chemicals. You can buy a couple of apps and buy a book. And so I'm selling you some education. Um, so this is what we've got. This is what I think will make your job easier. And, um, and you will have less problem pools. You will have, uh, you will save money. On, on all of your chemicals on your pools. Uh, you'll have happier customers and um, maybe even be able to take on an extra pool or two. So um, we also, the Pool Chemistry Training Institute also offers a one day certification course. Um, they will be given throughout the country uh, as soon as we can add some more instructors. We are looking for instructors now and we'll be expanding our program. But it is a, a one-day program. Um, it is the only certified pool chemistry course for residential pools being offered. It is not the CPO course. It's one day on pool chemistry. It will validate your school, your, your skills. You can attract new business. You can exceed your competition. You can start saving money following this method. And um, you will be certified for three years. Um, and at the end of three years, uh, we will probably have an online course for you to renew so that you don't have to go attend another course. Um, we also have patches and um, uh, diplomas that you will get when you pass the course. Um, actually, certificates of, of achievement, not a diploma. So. Um, Anyway, look for a course in your area. They'll also be posted on our websites. Um, people that pass the course will also be listed on the Pool Chemistry Training Institute website as a certified service technician. So um, uh, I thank you for listening today. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be glad to take your questions. And if not, I guess we're a little short of our two hours, but. Uh, if we have any questions, I'd like to open it up, and whatever you've got questions on, I'd be glad to help you. Perfect. Bob, um, I've, I've got some of these uh, beautiful purple uh, crystals that are forming on one of my water features. Uh, any, any idea what causes beautiful purple crystals around copper? And purple crystals, absolutely. I, 
I was the first person in the industry to find out what the purple crystals were. Uh, back in about 1980, I saw some purple crystals on pools and I had no idea what they were. And I was still in those days trying to figure everything out. And so I went out to pools and scraped some off and I tested them in my lab and I couldn't find anything. So I, I sent them to some outside labs and actually in those days had an x-ray diffraction done. And an x-ray diffraction done in those days the test alone cost about $1,000. Now they have handheld XRFs that you can use and buy for a few hundred bucks. But in those days, I spent like $1,000 and they came back and said, well, we know there's copper in there and we know there's this other organic chemical, but we don't know what it is. And so um, at the time, I had, had some friends at Monsanto Company, the manufacturer of cyanuric acid, and I sent them the powder print from the XRF, and they sent back and said, this is copper and cyanuric acid. And I said, wow, really? And so I studied a little farther and found out it was called copper cyanurate, and it is purple crystals, and it usually forms first on metal in the pools, and then eventually will form on the pool itself. But it comes from a high copper level and a high cyanuric acid level, and nobody noticing and the pH getting actually high. And then somebody, I mean, the pH getting lower and lower and lower, and then somebody raising the pH up to where it should be. And when you raise the pH, you change the saturation point of the copper and it comes out of the water as copper cyanurate. And um, uh, you can acid wash it to get it off. Um, or on metal surfaces, perhaps abraded with some, some wet dry sandpaper or a wheel. Um, but um, you can acid wash it off, but it comes from high copper, high cyanurate uh, in the pool, and um, uh, it gets all, over, gets all over everything. The, um, we talk a lot about water uh, testing and chemicals, when we end up getting into the areas that we've just come out of for the last 10 to 15 years, and people think that tabs have been around forever, and they actually haven't. When I first started cleaning pools, we were cleaning two, three times a week, and we were mostly on liquid bleach. Um, but when that cyanuric acid gets high, does that alter your test readings as far as a Taylor test kit, or a, are, are you getting accurate readings when you've got 150 parts per million of uh, cyanuric acid in the water? Yeah, the the, um, the test is not very much affected by cyanuric acid. Um, uh, most of the tests, there are some of them that can be affected a little bit. The, the titration test, the alkalinity and the, and the hardness test can be affected when you get up in the 200 parts per million range. Um, they can be affected a little bit. Um, but bear in mind that you need an awful lot of chlorine in there to prevent algae when you've got that happening. And, and people say, well, yeah, but I've been having, you know, I've been keeping the chlorine level between two and four parts per million, um, you know, for years. And I got cyanurate at 300 parts per million in the pool. And, you know, I don't have algae growing and stuff like that. And, you know, my answer to that is that, yes, you do have a problem. And can you tell me that in that pool, all you do is maintain two to four parts per million and you don't ever shock it. You don't ever add an algicide. You don't ever, you don't ever add a phosphate remover. You don't ever add any remedial chemicals to the pool to prevent something from happening. And, and most of the time what we find is they're doing a weekly shock with chlorine. They're getting the chlorine level up to 10 or 20 parts per million. They're adding phosphate removers. They're adding um, uh, algicides because they got an algae bloom, you know, and so, um, yeah, they've been doing it and they've not been having a problem, but that's because they think that, that you know, algae is not a problem, I guess. I don't know. But um, to me, a problem is you add chlorine to the pool and you don't ever have to add algicides, phosphate removers, um, shock the pool, anything like that. You don't have to do that. And with the method that we're talking about, you don't have to do that. You don't have to shock the pool. You don't have to add algicides. 
you probably won't even need a phosphate remover unless the phosphate level goes really high. I mean, up into the thousands, you know, and, and that can happen too because um, source water these days is changing rapidly. The, the pipes for the distribution drinking water system are, are in some cases 100 years old and they're iron pipes and they, they want to prevent the iron from further coming out of their pipes. So they put in uh, agents, usually phosphate, to reduce the corrosion in the pipes. And then the phosphate ends up being in your pool and over continually adding water due to evaporation, the phosphate level can build up in the pool. So you can't have a problem from that. But um, uh, basically this method uh, all you need is what we've talked about today. You don't need a bunch of specialty chemicals. You don't need to shock your pool. You just need to keep doing what, we, what this method says. And when you go to another seminar or something and listen to somebody saying, it's okay to keep a higher cyanuric acid level, you know, most of the information I've seen about people saying, it's okay to keep a higher cyanurate level, what they mean is it's okay for killing bacteria and and they don't realize all of the other problems that you can have by having a cyanuric acid level that's high. You can get algae growing. You can get corrosive water because you have to take in round numbers one third of the cyanuric acid level and subtract it from your alkalinity level. And when you get upwards of 150 or 200 parts per million of alkalinity, now you're talking about an adjustment of 50 to 70 parts per million minus what your alkalinity is. So if you, even if you're keeping an alkalinity of 100 or 110, when you subtract 70 from that, your, al your carbonate alkalinity is now 40. You think 40 is a good alkalinity to have in a pool? No way. No. Absolutely not. It's corrosive no. water. We, so, you know, we hear a lot about CDC, the Center uh, for Disease Control, and I think uh, I've seen some reports that they suggest that uh, cyanuric acid can be toxic and that we're not supposed to have more than 15 parts per million. And I know we as an industry reject that a little bit, but I, I believe that's a CDC uh, statement. Well, they're saying 50, they've always said 50 parts per million. But now they're saying that, that you can run a pool without it and you can, uh, and that, that zero is okay. Well, maybe it is for a commercial pool. Maybe they want to do that that way. But, but in residential pools, I'm, I want to tell you a couple of things. First of all, it takes 10 parts per million of cyanuric acid to protect one part per million of free chlorine. So if you're going to maintain two to four parts per million of chlorine in your pool, what level of cyanuric acid do you have to have? 20 to 40, right? Yep. Okay, so, so if you got less than that, if you got 10 parts per million or 20 parts per million of, of CYA in the water and you put in four parts per million of chlorine, you got two parts per million that's unprotected. It's gonna be wiped out in 75% of it in two hours. So, so you need it to protect from that. People say, well, it's an indoor pool. Okay, so are you telling me there's no light in the indoor pool? You know, most indoor pools I've seen have skylights and most skylights let UV in. UV passes through skylights. So um, there's UV in there. And also if you don't use cyanuric acid, as I've explained, there's a huge exposure of people to chlorine because at two parts per million of chlorine without cyanuric acid, a, a person in the water is exposed to all two parts per million. Put some cyanuric acid in the water and they're exposed to 3% of the chlorine level, which is almost none. You know, what's 3% of two parts per million of chlorine? You know, it's a very low number, so there's less exposure. Um, so cyanuric acid is needed. And if nothing else, it saves money. Because if you do it in an outdoor pool, 
if you only use 20 parts per million in an outdoor pool, put in four parts per million of chlorine, two parts per million is going to be burned up in two hours. That costs money. You put it in, put in cyanuric acid uh, at the right level, now your chlorine is going to stay around eight times longer. So um, it's needed. And um, there is a toxicity level for cyanuric acid, but we don't seem to be paying very much attention to it because companies like Lamont have now started making a test strip that go to 500 parts per million of cyanuric acid. Wow. Are you kidding me? Diluting. A pool with 500 parts per million of acid, you can't put enough chlorine in there to keep the algae from growing. That's crazy. It is, for sure. Well, if you guys have any questions for Bob, Bob, this has been great. A couple hour seminar, fantastic. You were scheduled to give this at the Western Pool and Spa Show. It was nice to have you uh, do it uh, live from Peru. You're sitting in Peru today uh, in your office and uh, broadcasting out to the world. At one point, we had well over 50 people both in the uh, in the Pool Pro room and then also in the, the it was uh, sent out on multiple different platforms, uh, 14 PSI, uh, shout out to those guys over there. Uh, Ask the Masters was duplicating it as well as Pool Pro. So, um, any any follow up questions here before we uh, or uh, we close this down today? Hey Bob, I have a question for you. Sure. Related to diluting acid before you pull it in, pour it in. Excuse me. There's lots of different information about that. Is it a chemical reason or is it more to make sure that you're not causing damage to the finish? It's, it's just a matter of causing damage to the finish. Um, I, I don't know, can everybody hear the question, uh, Randy? Yes, they can. Okay, yeah. I wasn't sure if I needed to repeat the question. Um, yeah, the only reason to dilute the acid is just to, to protect the surface. And frankly, uh, if you pour the acid right out of the bottle in front of a, a return line with a pump going on, it's probably enough to disperse it without worrying about it. But, you know, if you, if for safety's sake, one reason or another, you want to dilute it first. Just remember to add the acid to the water, not, not the, the water to the acid. And the best way to remember that is that you always add acid to the pool. You don't add the pool to the acid. And because let me tell you, if you add a little bit of water to some acid, it'll jump right back at you. And you can get acid on you in a hurry. So, um, And that acid column thing doesn't work I have heard for more than 40 years that if you pour acid in one spot, it lowers alkalinity. And if you pour it around the pool, it lowers pH. And that is just total BS. It doesn't work. It's not true. Thank you, Bob. As always, right. very informative. I always appreciate going to any of your classes. And thanks for taking your time today. Well, you guys are welcome. I always like talking about you know, this is my life's passion, and, and I try to understand everything I can about water. I keep learning about it so I can pass it along to you guys. And, you know, I mean, things are changing in the chemistry, chemical industry because we are understanding the chemistry better. And, you know, if you think about it, five, ten years ago, nobody was talking about borates. Nobody was talking about how much chlorine you need in the pool with relation to cyanuric acid. Nobody was talking about lower cyanuric acid levels. Um, you know, nobody, we have better testing methods now. We have these devices. Um, I don't too much like to talk about uh, brand names. I try to keep away from that. But we have things like the, the Spin Touch and some of the other uh, devices that are out there that are our readers and way to make our testing more accurate. Um, the more accurate tests we get, the better we are able to, to take care of the water. And um, um, so, you know, who knows what the next few years is going to gain. But um, many of the things we talked about today were not talked about five years ago. Some of them were talked about five years ago by me, and I was labeled as a maverick and a crackpot and didn't know what I was talking about. And today is everybody saying, gee, the guy's a genius. So... <laughs> So I don't really know whether I am or not, but I keep passing along information as I get it. And if something changes, I'll, I'll let the world know. Randy, you're on mute. Yeah. 
Okay. Guess, guess I should unmute, huh? Hey, he, his name is Bob Lowry, and all of these books are available on Amazon. Um, this recording will stay up in all of the different channels. If you'd like to go back, we, uh, we're seeing some people that came in late asking some questions over on the Facebook channel. Um, if you go back through and, and take it from start to start to the end, I think you'll, all those questions will be answered again. Uh, Robert Lowry, thank you so much live from Peru, and uh, we'll see you on the internet. Okay, we'll see you all later. Thanks. Stay safe, watch out for the coronavirus, and, and pay attention to the A new voice in the industry, a resource for all, education for you. This is Pool Pro Podcast. Build relationships and share important news as we get ready for our next backyard adventure. Pool Pro Podcast, backyard adventures are better together. Please take a moment to share, like, and review our content with all of those that would be interested.